we all have friends and we love them, but would you trust them with your life? In this really insane case, a girl who thought she was just hanging out with her friends later found out they had something terrible planned out for her. This is the story of the 16-year-old boys who murdered their friend. Cassie Jo Stoddart was born in Pocatello, Idaho in December 1989. She had two siblings, an older sister Christy and a younger brother Andrew. She and her siblings were raised by their grandparents for a while when they were younger, but eventually went to live with their mom and stepdad. Cassie was described as being artistic with a love for music. She was smart, kind, and very responsible. Everyone knew that they could count on Cassie to do the right thing. So when her aunt and uncle, Allison and Frank Contreras would go out of town, they would hire Cassie to house sit for them and watch over their pets, two dogs, and three cats. At the time that this story was taking place, Cassie was a junior at Pocatello High School, where she had met her boyfriend, Matt Beckham. After school on Friday, September 22nd, 2006, Cassie went to her aunt and uncle's house on Whispering Cliffs Drive in the northeast Bannock County, where she would house sit until Sunday. Since the house was in a pretty remote area, she asked her aunt and uncle if Matt could come and hang out with her in the evenings, and they agreed. Matt arrived at around 6 p.m. that evening, and the two decided to watch a movie called Kill Bill, Volume 2. What Cassie didn't know was that Matt had also invited his two friends, Tori Admick and Brian Drapper, to hang out. They were both Matt and Cassie's classmates, and while Cassie considered them friends, they weren't really that close. So when the two boys arrived, Cassie was a bit upset since she had promised her aunt and uncle that she would only be having one friend over. But Matt assured her that it was okay since they were just going to hang out. Cassie gave the boys a tour of the house, and then they all went to the living room and continued with the movie. But just halfway through, Tori and Brian left, saying they wanted to watch a movie at the theater instead, and Cassie was left alone with Matt. A few minutes later, Cassie and Matt started hearing some weird sounds coming from the basement, and then the lights went out. They knew the power circuit was in the basement, but they were so freaked out that instead of going to check, they decided to just stay in the living room, hoping that the lights would come back on. And after a while, they did, though that did not calm them down. They noticed that one of the family dogs kept staring down the basement stairs, barking and growling at something. This really spooked them out. When Matt saw how scared Cassie was, he decided to call his mom and ask if he could spend the night and keep Cassie company. But Matt's mom refused and instead offered for Cassie to come and stay over at their house. However, being the ever-responsible teen that she was, Cassie felt that it was her responsibility to stay. But that decision would later prove to be fatal. At around 10.30 p.m., Matt was picked up by his mom, leaving Cassie alone in the house. He never imagined that it would be the last time he saw Cassie alive. On September 24th, the Contreras came back from their trip, and what they found was truly horrifying. Frank and Allison's 13-year-old daughter was the first to enter the house, and as soon as she got to the living room, she started screaming. Blood was everywhere, on the carpet, the furniture, and the walls. Cassie's lifeless body was lying next to the couch in a pool of blood. Frank immediately called the police and Cassie's parents. Her mom and stepdad arrived as soon as they received the devastating news. Investigators quickly arrived and started processing the scene. They found no signs of forced entry suggesting that Cassie had let her killer into the house, meaning that she knew them. Apart from the living room, the rest of the house seemed intact. Nothing appeared to be missing, which ruled out burglary as a motive. The Contreras, dogs, and cats were locked in a separate room, but were unharmed. The autopsy report showed the sheer brutality of the attack. She had been stabbed about 30 times in her chest, neck, back, and abdomen. The injuries had been caused by two knives, and 12 of the stab wounds were fatal. It appeared that she had been dead for two days, which means that she was murdered on Friday night. But who could do such a gruesome thing, and why? Investigators soon found out that Cassie's boyfriend, Matt, was the last person to see her alive. Given the gruesome way in which the murder happened, Matt seemed to be the only obvious suspect. But when he was brought in for questioning, investigators quickly ruled him out. Matt was very cooperative and told the cops everything that happened, including the weird noises and the lights going off, and how he had called his mother to ask if he could spend the night. He told how Tori and Brian had left earlier and how he had called Tori to let him know that he was leaving, but Tori was whispering and claimed to be in the movie theater. He went on to tell investigators how he had repeatedly called Cassie the following day, but she never answered. Investigators also found phone records that backed Matt's statement. The police then asked him about his friends, Tori and Brian. 
He said that he was better friends with Tori and that Cassie was also friends with them, but they weren't close. Both boys had been interested in Cassie in the past and had even flirted with her. Investigators then brought Tori and Brian in for questioning and placed them in separate interrogation rooms. They both told detectives that when they left the Contreras' house, they went to watch a film and later spent the night at Brian's place. But when the detectives asked them to describe the movie they had allegedly watched, neither of them was able to. What's the whole premise or the plot of the movie? What's it all about? Uh, well, it was... After several days of interrogation, Brian finally cracked. He told the investigators everything that happened, but placed the blame on Tori. According to Brian, he and Tori went to Cassie's that night, and when she was showing them the basement, Brian unlocked the door, which led to the backyard without Cassie's knowledge. So when they later pretended to leave, they actually went back to the car, put on some costumes, which included dark clothes, gloves, and white masks, and then quietly entered the house from the basement. They started making loud noises and turned off the lights to lure Cassie and Matt to the basement, where they would scare them. But when they never came down, they turned the lights back on. Tori and Brian stayed in the basement for a while waiting for Matt to leave. They knew that his mother would pick him up at 10.30 p.m. and Cassie would be alone. When Matt finally left, they started messing around with the circuit breaker again, hoping that Cassie would come down. And when she didn't, Tori ran up the stairs and began stabbing her. Brian tried to downplay his role in the murder, even claiming that Tori had threatened him. But when Tori learned that Brian had talked and implicated him, he tried to defend himself by pointing the finger back at Brian, saying that it was all Brian's idea. He claimed that he thought they were just going to scare Cassie. He insisted that he believed they were just making a movie like the horror film, Scream. He claimed that when they were in the basement, he was too scared to go upstairs. But when he eventually went up, he found Brian had already stabbed Cassie to death. While they both both insisted the other did it, evidence revealed a very disturbing tale. Brian took investigators to a stash of evidence that they had buried in the Black Rock Canyon area. The evidence included white and red Halloween masks, a pair of gloves, and four different knives, one of which looked like a dagger and another had a serrated blade. But the most damning of them all was a videotape with footage of the two killers planning to take Cassie. Life. In the footage, investigators would learn that Brian and Tori considered themselves as budding filmmakers, mainly interested in making documentary-style films. They had a dark fascination with serial killers and were especially obsessed with the horror movie Scream. They went around recording themselves and sharing their dark thoughts on camera. There should be no odd against killing people. I know it's a wrong thing, but you know, hell, you should... hell. You restrict somebody from it, they're gonna want it more. They had even written what they called a death list, which contained names of some of their classmates and friends, including Cassie. In the video footage, Brian can be seen talking about Cassie being their first victim. Our first victim is going to be Cassie Stoddard. She's gonna be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? They had been following her around, sort of even stalking her and recording it on camera. This this footage was taken on the morning of the murder. How sick is that? Then get this guys, they even recorded themselves after committing the heinous and gruesome act. I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body. Brian and Tori were tried separately for Cassie's murder. Brian's trial started on April 17th, 2007, while Tori's began on May 31st, 2007. Due to the horrific and gruesome nature of the crime, it was decided that they would be tried as adults. They were both found guilty of first-degree homicide and conspiracy to commit murder and sentenced to a life sentence in prison without the possibility of parole, plus 30 years to life for the conspiracy charge. And it did not end there. Both boys have appealed their conviction several times hoping to get lesser sentences. Tori still continues to maintain that he's innocent and his family has been firmly supporting him all the way. His mother, Shannon Admick, even wrote a book about her son and his experience as being tried as an adult despite being a juvenile at the time. Now guys, I get that no one wants to believe that their own son is a cold-blooded killer, but there's just too much evidence showing that Tori was guilty. Some of his classmates even came out to say how he would brag about committing the perfect crime. So while I feel bad for both Tori and Brian's families, I believe that the boys got what they deserved. 
deserved. The only victim here is Cassie. She thought that these people were her friends while they were plotting against her. She was a beautiful and kind person and did not deserve any of this. I hope that her family will one day be able to get over their pain. May she rest in peace. Did Tori and Brian get what they deserved? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section.